you know, of all of the horror retrospectives that I've done on the channel so far, this one may bring me the most heat. And it sucks because I've been trying to convince everyone for years that this movie is not nearly as bad as anyone says it is. As far as Guilty Pleasures go, this is a movie that is up there with Jason Takes Manhattan. It's one that I've always really enjoyed, but the majority of horror fans that I encounter absolutely sat on since the day it came out. So yes, I am about to defend Texas Chainsaw 3D. Kind of. And look, I know it's not great. The continuity is a bit off from the 1974 original. Some of the dialogue sounds like it was written by a child. It's kind of hokey and weird and it does some strange things. But overall, I've always had a blast watching this thing. And not only is it a fun watch, but this movie was a requel before requels were really a thing. It paved the way for things like the Blumhouse Halloween trilogy, Jeepers Creepers Reborn, The Exorcist Believer. And I know some of those films, depending on your take on it, uh, don't have the greatest track record. I think people are maybe starting to get kind of worn out of the requel thing. Um, but this kind of was one of the first ones to do that concept. I've always dug the actual concept and the idea of this movie. It's just that the execution in parts comes off as kind of wacky and hokey. Like, for example, I know that we're dealing with the concept of family and all, but I personally wouldn't have had every single character remind you every four and a half seconds that they're Sawyers and that they, this is their this is their blood, they're Sawyer. It's just, it, it's overkill. It's little things like that that I think really drag this movie down in a big way. But if you look at this and if you watch Texas Chainsaw 3D as a slasher, just as a straight slasher flick, it's a fun horror movie. It's fun as hell. It's executed pretty decently as a fun slasher movie. Let's just go ahead and get this out of the way. Nothing will ever top Toby Hooper's 1974 original film. That movie was ahead of its time. The social commentary, the nasty, gritty feel, and the aesthetic of the world that was built through the set design, the style of storytelling, that just, that won't ever be recreated ever again, at least in the same way. But what I can say about this film is that it did feel like a nice bridge between the two worlds in terms of the concept of family and the tying in the ending of the original film and kind of building that up a little bit. It, it gave it its best shot at trying to connect with the, the, the tissue uh, of the original film. It tried to plug in in a, an interesting way. Now, whether or not you think that that way failed or succeeded, that's a personal preference thing, but it did try to at least pull from that original source material and use it to propel this story forward. Texas Chainsaw 3D knows exactly what it is, and it does not stray from that. It comes across as a fun 80s slasher film, and sure, it's a little silly and kind of over the top at times, but so were many of your favorite slasher films from the 80s and 90s. It quickly establishes this family angle, and it runs with it full force, almost annoyingly so sometimes. Which, honestly, I find it kind of endearing, and yes, I know it's kind of hokey, but there's something about it that I've always just kind of dug. Like, I think in this context, as a fun slasher movie, it's okay to be a little hokey sometimes. I mean, let's just be honest with ourselves. I saw this in the theater. Many of you probably saw this in the theater. Did any of us buy tickets to Texas Chainsaw 3D because you wanted a story that was some deep emotional drama? Have you ever watched a movie in this franchise, in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise, because you wanted some intellectual uh, story that touches the deepest roots of your soul? No! You watch it for this! Speaking of the original film, I actually like the little recap of it at the beginning. It kind of gives me the same vibes as when Freddy's giving the complete history of the Elm Street and Friday the 13th franchises at the very beginning of Freddy vs. Jason. It's just kind of foggy jump cuts of the events of the 1974 original. Maybe the biggest point of contention amongst horror fans and definitely amongst Texas Chainsaw Massacre fans is that in this film, they actually tried to get you to sympathize with the Sawyers using the only thing that is 10 times scarier than a cannibalistic family that hunts human beings for food. An armed, unregulated redneck militia. 
No, but in all seriousness, they do make you sympathize with the Sawyers right from the very beginning of the film. They pin them as misunderstood caged rats that are just viciously murdered by this group of people that hate them, that, you know, just don't understand them, which is odd considering the events of the first film. I mean, go back and watch the 1974 original. It's like, these, they, they were about to eat her. They were trying to beat Sally over the head to kill her and then, like, prepare her body as food. Like, it, it's a weird disconnect that I, I understand why people just like hate that concept with a passion. I get it, I really, really do. I don't have quite as much of a problem with it as I think some other horror fans do, but trust me when I say, I get it. My only foil to that is that with this film, it's kind of the only thing that makes this idea work. As we see in the original film, Leatherface definitely is not all there, developmentally, psychologically, he's delayed. Right? His family's way of life is all he knows, and that's dangerous because I don't think that he can differentiate between right or wrong. All he knows is that we need food. These strangers are uh, probably, in his mind, attacking his family home, and he knows to protect them. That's all he knows to do. Essentially, Leatherface is only doing Th what he's grown up knowing. He doesn't know any better than what he's doing to Sally and her friends. He knows no different than this awful, sick, twisted way of living. I've said this in previous videos and on live streams, but in a weird way, you can almost sympathize with Leatherface because part of you just, you know, maybe it's the teacher in me, I don't know, but part of me can't help but feel like if Leatherface would have grown up in a different setting, maybe he wouldn't have become the monster that he is. They obviously don't treat him well. We see that the hitchhiker and Drayden treated him very, very poorly. He's just kind of their, you know, their front man of this whole operation they have going here. He's the one who does the dirty work, and they've kind of fooled him into doing that. Again, it's all he knows. He doesn't know any better. I mean, hell, in the original film, after the second or third person that he catches and kills, he seems completely scared and overwhelmed. He doesn't get why this is happening. He doesn't understand why these random people are, in his mind, invading his family's space and their property. He's having a hard time processing that. And the only thing that he knows to do is to defend his home. As we know, most human behaviors are learned. So being raised in this environment with these people contributed to the creation of this sick monster. But it's not like Leatherface was the sole villain of the 1974 film. Drayton and the Hitchhiker were in on it, possibly even more so than Leatherface. They were, they're all there. Like, I mean, obviously they're crazy people, but they can intellectualize what they're doing. Like they're, they're not stupid. They know exactly what they're doing. And really the only reason that they were caught was because Sally got away from Leatherface at the end of the film. My point in all of this is that, yes, is it odd that they make us sympathize with the Sawyers? Yes. But the caveat to that is just because you can sympathize with Leatherface as a villain does not make him any less of a monster. It doesn't justify what he's doing but you just kind of understand why in a weird, sick, twisted way. In Texas Chainsaw 3D, we add a whole bunch of random family members to the mix. Like we straight up triple the size of the Sawyer family in a span of like an hour or two, which is really all that elapses between the end of the 1974 film and the flashback sequence in this film. And I know there's an obvious question that like, you know, who, who the hell are these? Like, where did they come from? Where were they during the events of the original? Like, why weren't they there? Why didn't we see them? And then suddenly it's like, boom, Sally escapes, Leatherface is back in the house. And there's this whole slew of Sawyers that are like holed up with guns and weapons. And they're all like, well, waiting the police to show up. It's kind of strange. In my mind, they're there for two reasons. A, to provide uh, an opportunity for cameos by Gunnar Hansen and Marilyn Burns, Bill Mosley, John Dugan, and B, to just give you more people to feel sorry for. I mean, honestly, all we see these other characters do is defend themselves against Hartman's redneck mob, and then they die a fiery death inside the house. That's it. The hitchhiker's gone at this point in the film, so other than Drayton and Grandpa, we don't really have an emotional connection to any of them. They're just people that we see trying to defend themselves and dying against this redneck militia. 
And yes, we can assume that they were in on the crazy cannibalistic thing too, but the thing is, from a storytelling perspective, we didn't see any of them do that. The only two people in this case, because the hitchhiker's dead at this point, the only two people in the family that we have any type of negative emotional attachment to are Drayton and Grandpa. The other ones are just, we, we see them as a group of people that are trying to defend themselves, defending their family, their property, their home, and we see them brutally murdered by Burt Hartman's crew, which come across as 10 times more hostile and violent than the Sawyers do. And that's not all. Verna, Heather's long lost grandmother that leaves her the mansion with Leatherface living in the basement. She's been taking care of him for all of these years since the events of the 1974 original is described as a good woman and the salt of the earth by Farnsworth. Uh, at the end of the film, when Heather's reading Verna's letter, she describes Leatherface. She's describing Leatherface as a good boy that is family bound and who will protect you. I mean, it's strange to think of these characters in that way because in the original film that family was sick and vile and nasty and they were doing terrible things to people looking around the house it was evident that sally's crew they weren't the first people that they did this to they've been doing this for a long time and it, it, it ain't their first rodeo so i i completely understand why i understand two things i understand why this film needed the sympathy angle to push this narrative forward, the family thing. But I also understand why the naysayers, why hardcore TCM fans look at Texas Chainsaw 3D and they're like, dude, why are we trying to sympathize with these people? They are sick, twisted, cannibalistic murderers. That's what they are. Why are we sympathizing with them? I get it. Now, the additions to the Sawyer family weren't the only continuity things that were a bit off. During the events of Texas Chainsaw 3D, Heather should be around 38 years old. I don't get the vibe that she's that old in the movie. She was a baby during the events of the 1974 original, which took place between 1973 and 1974. Texas Chainsaw 3D takes place in 2012. I don't know. It's not a super big thing. It's just continuity-wise. It's those little things that I feel like it, it, the movie should have taken place 10 or 15 years sooner than it did. I think the ages would have lined up both with Leatherface and with Heather a little bit more. It's just, it's those little tiny continuity things that I think would have kind of pushed the movie into the next level. Speaking of characters, Heather's friends. Yikes. Now, it's pretty obvious from the get-go that their main purpose in the movie is to die. I mean, stupid choices, stupid lines, everything from the forced cheating angle to allowing the stranger hitchhiker dude to stay in the mansion that you just inherited from your long lost grandmother. What? Not waiting for the gate to open in the first big chase scene. I mean, they're just so incompetent in so many ways. Heather is without a doubt the most cohesive, well-written character, which is a good thing because the story quite literally revolves around her. The others, not so much. And that's either a good or a bad thing, depending on how you look at it. On one hand, having relatively uninteresting characters paves the way for fun kills. You're focused on Leatherface, you're focused on the gore and the, the, the fun in the moment. It's kind of a situational type thing. You're not feeling as much tension and build up. You're not fearful for the characters. You're just watching for Leatherface. You know what I mean? You're rooting in a weird way for Leatherface. Again, kind of tying into the whole like we sympathize with them you're rooting for them you're not rooting for the technical good side even though they weren't really good in this film um but you know you're you're rooting for leatherface in those kill scenes when he's attacking the friends you're like hey I i'm here for the return of one of horror's biggest icons that's what i'm here for but the downside is just that you don't feel sympathetic for the characters there's no tension and build into their death they're just there to die. Again, the purpose of this movie was not to ever make you feel sympathetic towards the victims like the original was. It's to make you feel sympathetic for Heather and for the Sawyers and oddly enough for Leatherface. And again, I get why people hate this concept. They're supposed to be evil savages that eat people. You're not supposed to feel any kind of remorse 
for them and for the things that they've done. You're not supposed to understand it. You're supposed to be repulsed by it. But somehow this movie does a pretty bang up job at making you feel something for those characters. Like it or not, by the end of the movie, you kind of feel sympathetic towards them. I mean, when Heather is reading the police files after the carnival sequence, the files say that the Sawyers were complying and that they were brutally murdered by Bert Hartman's gang. It literally says that the Sawyer family was massacred and slaughtered. That's the pot calling the kettle black, my friend. It almost makes me forget that in this timeline of events, literally just hours earlier, the Sawyers were murdering and slaughtering people. Like, that's where you've got to give credit where credit is due. Like it or not, Texas Chainsaw 3D does a pretty dang good job at making them sympathetic villains. It almost makes you forget that literally in this timeline and the flashback at the beginning of the film, hours prior to their deaths, the Sawyers were literally murdering and slaughtering people for food, for food in their home. And you've got to give credit where credit is due. In that moment when they're being burned alive, when you see him kick the chick and take the baby, like, you kind of feel a little bit of remorse for them. Like, you don't like what those people are doing. And of course, we're seeing this through Heather's eyes. She's understanding her family history for the first time, so you feel sympathetic towards her above all. On the other hand, you've got Bert Hartman and the redneck gang of Heather's quote-unquote adopted parents of the cop, Marvin. Those people, the boys, the good old boys that Bert wants to go torch the mansion once he finds out that Leatherface has been living there all this time, those people you feel zero remorse for. It's that good old boy attitude and the constant references to the good book, can't get around the good book, Bert, uh, that just kind of make you root for Leatherface by the end of the movie. This is all you heard. Not for now, sir. Can't get around the good book. I mean, there's some downright utterly stupid lines in this movie. But the constant references to the good book, can't get around the good book, that good book, the, you know, the good book. I mean, it's just like, use it once, maybe twice. Maybe is kind of the final cap. You say it once at the beginning, once at the end. It's, it's mentioned 10 times. The good book is mentioned 10 times in this movie. And it's just like, bro, stop. <laughs> we get it. Kind of makes Hooper's final statement of it at the end of the film feel pretty good. I really like Farnsworth's explanation of Leatherface's motives and Verna's thought process in the movie. By the final third of the film, Heather's read the police files. She knows everything that's happened. When she meets up with Farnsworth, he explains that Verna wanted Heather to live a much safer life than she ever could have with her original family, which is why she left her intentionally with the Millers. He also explains that Leatherface has the body of a man with the emotions of an eight-year-old, and that while he knows that his cousin does exist, he doesn't know who she is or what she would look like. And you know, he even says, and he's right, the last time Leatherface let a girl escape, he literally lost his entire family and everything that he knew. So yeah, you kind of get his thought process in that moment too. Honestly, in my opinion, the biggest downfall of Texas Chainsaw 3D is not the concept itself, but it's the really, really corny choices made sometimes. Like, it's little character moments. Um, there's a couple moments at the end of the film, which we're going to get to in a minute, the constant having to recreate the concepts of the original with the dirty van, the traveling to Texas, the picking up the hitchhiker. Like, it's just, it's, it's things like that that I, I don't think it needed any of that. Like, I would have traded the references to the original film for actual well-written side characters. I think that would have made the film, it would have elevated it to a much bigger level. And then you've got really cool ideas that are capped with some doozies, man. Perfect example. The whole plot twist where we reveal that Scott Eastwood, the, the pretty boy cop, is Burt Hartman's son. Cool plot twist. I dig it. But then we have to ruin it with the moment where uh, it's revealed that he's his son. He's got Heather in the back of the car. And really, really out of character moment for both of them. He's being all like, good old boy, pretty boy now. 
And then she kind of settles into this weird out of character moment that's fleeting. But she's like, so you're a Hartman, huh? And he's like, yep. And she takes the knife and st like stabs it through the little air hole in the back of the, the police cruiser. And she's like, well, I'm a Sawyer. And she's like, look at it. It's like, what? Where, where, where did that come from? Like, I, okay, you're embracing it. I understand. But that moment makes me cringe so... It's my least favorite moment in the entire movie. It feels so out of place. That could have been completely left out of the script. And I'd have been completely fine. That's such a weird moment. Now, arguably the best thing that Texas Chainsaw 3D does is the Leatherface character. I appreciate that all in all, it really does feel like a natural progression of the character that we met in 1974. And really, this is another point that I wanted to bring up. Does he look the same? No. Does he move the same? No. But it's the essence of the character that really matters. Not that we get an exact look-alike, not that we get an exact replica of what we got, but it's the essence of the character that we want to feel. Perfect example. We just covered Mike Flanagan's Doctor Sleep on the 30th episode of our horror show, Purely and Simply Evil. In that film, we see what is supposed to be Jack Torrance. We see the twin ghost girls. We see Wendy and Danny. The actors and the performances in that movie are supposed to embody the original character, not an exact replica, an exact reincarnation of the original actor. It's supposed to embody the character themselves, not the performer. Now, does it take a good performer to pull that off? Absolutely. But I think the same concept applies here for Leatherface. I 100% believe that this is the same person, the same iteration of that character, just an older, more seasoned version of that character. Based on what we know of the character as the audience, I fully believe that this is the same Leatherface that we saw open the door, hit the dude on the head with a hammer, and then slam it in the beginning of the original 1974 film. I think that Leatherface had some really great moments in this movie. Moments that would have possibly been made a little bit better without the 3D aspect of the film, which is something that we haven't even really touched on yet. As much as I love Texas Chainsaw 3D, the choice to put it in 3D just did not work for me. Granted, I'm not really a big fan of 3D in any cinematic context, maybe like a Star Wars film, maybe like a top tier Marvel film, but it just, it it doesn't really do it for me in any movie setting. I'm just, I've never been a big 3D fan. I thought the violence and the gore in this movie was good enough to stand on its own without the 3D element added to it. The gore wasn't overdone, but when it happened, you felt it. I mean, I think it was a really nice balance actually between overdone and underdone. We saw just enough to get the point across, and sometimes I think that's more effective than this overly gratuitous, just like there's gallons of blood being dumped all over the floor. It was just, it, we don't need all of that. The original film didn't have that. For a movie called The Texas Chainsaw Massacre, you would think that would just be an absolute gore fest. And it wasn't. Like the original Halloween, there's not a whole lot of blood in that movie. I think that was another way that it kind of bridged with the 1974 film. It didn't rely on blood and gore to get its point across. When it was there, again, you felt it, you see it, you get it, you get what it's trying to do. It's happening, but it didn't rely on that to tell a good story. The point was the story, not the blood, not the guts, not the violence, not the chainsaw. Look, I am not trying to convince you that Texas Chainsaw 3D is some misunderstood masterpiece because it's not. The movie is flawed in many ways, and just about any criticism that you could potentially throw at it is probably valid. But the thing is, it achieved its purpose. It's a fun slasher movie that delivers on some really cool Leatherface moments. It tries to tap into that original creative root of the original film. Whether or not it succeeds is up to personal interpretation, but it did give it a shot. It took some liberties, it did some wild and crazy things, but it tried to be a good sequel to The Texas Chainsaw Massacre from 1974. So all in all, is the long lost cousin thing kind of dumb? 
yes, is the overall concept and idea of the movie being in 3D and the whole family thing and the direct sequel to the original. Is it kind of strange and corny? Yeah. But does that make it a terrible movie? Hell no. And I actually say this confidently. Texas Chainsaw 3D is one of my favorite films in this franchise. And I will stand by that. And again, let's be honest with ourselves. No one watches a movie in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise because they want some thought-provoking story on the meaning of family. You watch it for this. <laughs> It does some weird things, but it's a great watch still to this day. I remember it was a great theater experience too, watching people jump and scream and laugh in their 3D glasses. Of course, we went and saw it in 3D because how could you not? You know, people had a really good time with it. I still have a good time with it. I just rewatched it yesterday and I was like, man, this is a fun movie. I, I enjoy it from beginning to end, even with the crappy characters, even with the strange choices. I enjoy the Leatherface moments in this movie. I enjoy the Heather moments. I, I enjoy Texas Chainsaw 3D for what it is. And for that, it's all right in my book. A guilty pleasure for sure. Unlike the new Texas Chainsaw Massacre from a few years ago, that movie compared to this, no comparison. But as always, I want to hear your thoughts. So please be sure to leave me a comment down below. What are your thoughts on Texas Chainsaw 3D? Do you hate it? Do you love it? Are you kind of indifferent with it? Please tell me your thoughts in the comments below. Be sure to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and threads at LTM Podcast KY. The link to the Let's Talk Movies Facebook group is in the description below. Be sure to leave this one a like. We love you guys. We will talk to you soon. Peace.